Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of How to Maintain Happiness Throughout Your Life. Today I'd like to um, do a book review of Mark Manson's book. Uh, I believe this is his bestseller, The Subtle Art of Not Giving A. I won't say the last word because I don't want to be um, have a strike on YouTube. Um, given that I can't say the word, I would uh, let you know that... Um, there's a lot of profanity in the book, so if you, you're not comfortable with profanity, probably not a good book for you to read. Um, but uh, I, I found, though, the read was very he's, – he's a very entertaining writer, uh, and he's taken some pretty serious subject matter and made it light and entertaining. So he uh, certainly enjoyed the read, that's for sure. And there's um, – couple of cents uh, a sense that I get there's a theme of like uh, a get over yourself sort of theme and I don't know if he's writing this from his own perspective or just the observance of other people so um, we'll get into this more uh, in detail of course because that's what the book's about um, but uh, I want to draw on uh, Mr. Rogers. He gets picked on quite a bit when it comes to this subject matter. Um, and don't get me wrong, I actually have a lot of respect for Mr. Rogers. I think he was doing some great things. Um, but uh, a lot of people criticize him because he uh, had this idea of telling all kids, you're special. And then they grow up into entitlement entitled adults, young adults, and then when they get passed over for a promotion or, you know, they're not making enough money to buy a Ferrari, they're, they're devastated. Well, I'm special. Don't I deserve this? Well, um, the, the obvious argument to that is that, well, if everyone's special, then nobody's special, right? So, um, and then the other thing, too, uh, you might think that the book uh, is advice on how to stop caring about things, but it actually is not. What it is is just guidance on how to make better choices as to what we care about. So certainly uh, I've done this, and I'm sure of you, not I'm sure, but maybe look at your own life and think, Am I? is there anything that I'm getting anxiety and I'm caring about over something I can't control? And this is the thing, we, we we shouldn't worry and get anxious about things that are beyond our control, because what's that going to do for us other than make us miserable? So um, let's dive into it. Uh, I've, I've sort of changed the format. I figured out how to do a full screen share, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just learning the system. So uh, let's uh, dive in. Change here, go to the... Uh, Oh, where is it? Slide. Should start from this first slide. So here's a book here by Mark Manson. And then, so the first chat, well, this is in the introduction. So he starts off by talking about something called a feedback loop, which means that we have an emotional reaction to something that happens or a situation that we're in, but then we have an emotional reaction because we're having an emotional reaction, then it just creates a feedback loop. So to give you a more concrete example, let's say you have a bit of social anxiety, or even if you don't, you're invited to a party and you know that either somebody's going to be there, you're going to be nervous, and then you start feeling a bit of anxiety. And then you look at it and think, oh, geez, I'm stupid. You know, why, why am I being anxious about this? So now you're getting anxiety about being anxious. And then what happens is that creates more anxiety, and then on and on and on. It becomes a, uh, a feedback loop, right? And then the other thing, too, that he, he uh, gets into in, 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 in the introduction, uh, and again, this is the uh, special, the I am special kind of um, thing, is that we are bombarded in the media about people who rise to high levels of fame and fortune. Um, and fame doesn't necessarily mean movie star or musician, uh, high-level politicians, uh, celebrity CEOs. And uh, we start to think that that's normal. 
um, that oh well, this is how people live. But really, it's only it's only a select few who rise to this level of fame and fortune. And he doesn't say this, but I would argue that the reason why we don't all and we can't all rise to high levels of fame and fortune is because it takes a lot of sacrifice and a lot of work. And people just aren't willing to make that sacrifice. And I don't mean in the sense of they're weak, they're lazy or anything like that. It's just that people don't don't see that as a value. Uh, so they just don't pursue that kind of things, those kinds of things. So, however, I'm not saying we want to go to the other extreme and just stop trying uh, and just, you know, um, just accept that we should be failures in life. Uh, no, I would argue that we need, we do need challenges in life and overcoming challenges is what gives us a sense of accomplishment and uh, accumulating um, those accomplishments throughout life, that gives us a sense of happiness, right? And um, I, I just reviewed Atomic Habits and one of the things Atomic Habits talked about is that uh, motivation happens when we succeed half the time and fail half the time, right? So we don't want anything that's too low. So uh, a more concrete example is like, let's say we want to learn how to ch play chess. So if we uh, challenge a five-year-old to a chess game and we win, we're not really, unless you're a sociopath, you're not really going to feel good about yourself. Um, but if we took the time to uh, learning the chess moves is fairly simple. Um, I actually forget it, so I wouldn't know how to play chess. But um, the real art of chess is learning the strategies. And that's a lot of study from people I've known who, who got really good at chess. They spent a lot of time studying the, the strategies and the moves of the master chess players. So if you did that and took, you know, three, four, five years uh, studying that and practicing, and then you, you actually managed to win against someone who's considered a grandmaster or someone who's considered a very good chess player, you would feel a great sense of accomplishment. So, so again, just to drive home that uh, this book is not about being indifferent. It is about being comfortable with being different. And that the title uh, is really learning to care about what matters and to stop caring about what doesn't matter. So basically what we need to do is we need to find something meaningful to care about. And then another point that he makes, and he has a whole chapter dedicated to this, is that we're always making choices about what to care about in life, um, even on the most minor of things. So... Uh, so the first thing he talks about is happiness is a problem. And one of the interesting things uh, that studies, I, I can't quote any specific studies, but I did come across it recently, is that interestingly enough that uh, societies that became developed and uh, rose to a level of prosperity where having a roof over your head and food on the table was no longer a daily struggle. Interestingly enough, that happiness actually starts to go down at that point. Uh, people lose their sense of meaning, um, or, or at least I would argue that uh, in Western or modern societies, um, we're told to care about things that don't bring us happiness and to ignore the things that do bring us happiness. Uh, so a classic example, you take the United States, which is one of the most prosperous, if not the most prosperous nation in the world. Um, I just want to put a caveat that I, some people are arguing that, that they're turning a corner now and um, uh, the prosperity is actually going down. However, interestingly enough, that during the, this age of prosperity in the United States, they were also the largest consumers of antidepressants in the world. And one of the things... Uh, um, this ties into something called the Diderot effect, D-I-D-E-R-O-T. Uh, a writer, um, can't remember when it was, but around Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great gave uh, this person, Diderot, a lot of money. And 
uh, he bought something and then that lead, led to other purchases and to other purchases. And the reason being is that as we enjoy new comforts and luxuries in our lives, we adapt to them and then that leads us to explore more comforts and more luxuries. Uh, so, you know, an example is, uh, you know, somebody buys a Mercedes Benz and, you know, it just becomes another car to them. And then they want to buy the Ferrari and then the Bentley, then the Rolls Royce. And uh, then the Koenigsegg, I think is probably about as far as you can go with that. And then uh, Mark Manson, he says, uh, there are two things that lead us to unhappiness, two key things, I guess. And uh, that has to deal with our problems. And, and this is a core theme of the book, too, is that uh, life is about solving problems. And if we don't solve those problems, that's going to lead to unhappiness. And why wouldn't we solve our problems? For two reasons. One, we deny that the problem actually exists. Or two, uh, we play a victim and we expect other people to solve our problems. So, and, and we have to accept that having problems is just, that's just a normal part of life. And we have to learn to be comfortable with it. Um, uh, unless you're on happy drugs, um, we can't be happy 24 7, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a, a year. Um, we're going to have life's ups and life is going to bring us uh, ups and downs. And uh, we have to become comfortable with that. Um, so then the other thing, and this is again tying off the uh, one of the key themes of this book, is that we have to recognize that we aren't special. Uh, and then he talks about in the late 60s, early 70s, um, there was this uh, prevailing theory about childhood psychology where uh, we needed to build up children's self-esteem. And, and, and how we did that was we told them they were special and give them medals and honors for every little accomplishment they did. And then, um, but the, that created a problem because... Uh, it, it, it turned into people who uh, felt entitled to things in life. And then he talks about uh, two reasons, so why someone would feel entitled. So the first reason is somebody has a view, I'm awesome, everyone else sucks, and therefore I'm special. And there's a flip side of this. I suck, everyone else is awesome, so I'm special. And the fact of the matter is, is, for most of the people on earth, we're average people. We make an average income. We have average problems. Uh, so, um, and then just to reiterate the point, I, I sort of touched on it uh, earlier, is that if you follow media and advertising and things like that, we're led to believe that uh, it's normal to live life in the extreme, to be super rich or, or super famous. But the uh, again, life happens in the middle of everything, in, in the average and ordinary. So um, there's uh, something called the Tao, uh, which literally means the middle way, and and the Tao encourages us to choose choose the middle path. Don't don't live in the extremes. Um, and another thing, too, just uh, that reminds me, the problem with living the ex in the extremes is that when you end up in one extreme for a little while, you end up, uh, when you let that go, you swing, it's sort of like a, uh, um, a wrecking ball, I guess, you know, how a wrecking ball pulls back and then it, it bangs, it goes to the other extreme. So if you stop living in one extreme, you end up going to the other extreme. So... So basically, um, what we want to do is start measuring our success by more mundane factors. Um, ask yourself, am I being a good spouse? Am I providing for my family? Um, am I providing support to a, a friend who is in need um, or, or is suffering? Just regular, everyday life. Uh, and we need, to, we need to embrace the ordinary ordinariness, I guess, in life. 
So, um, so basically, this leads into the value of suffering. And in, in Buddhism, uh, there's this concept, there's the four noble truths. And the first noble truth is life is suffering. And the, the Pali or Sanskrit word, I can't remember, is D-U-K-K-H-A, dukkha. Uh, some people argue that it's, it's um, a more broader term than just suffering. It means being unsettled. Um, or uneasy in life. And that uh, if you want to overcome that, then you look at the, I won't get into that, but that's part of the four noble truths. And then Mark Manson pro proposes that uh, the amount that we suffer, I guess, uh, or our values rather, um, how much we, oh right, how much we suffer will be determined by, by our values. And our values will determine the nature of our problems, and our problems will determine the quality of our lives. Now, I don't wholeheartedly agree with him because there are problems we may face uh, that have nothing to do with our values, right? So, for instance, a single mother on social assistance will have a problem like, how am I going to feed my child this week? Um, that is a problem she has to face, but certainly not. That problem was not the result of her values. And a billionaire who has no problem putting food on the table will face a problem like, well, I drove my Ferrari the other day, and when I press down on the gas pedal, it doesn't, it doesn't give me that uh, um, feeling of acceleration. We're not, you know, only a handful of us own Ferraris and we'll ever have to worry about that. Uh, really, on any car, you do have to worry about the rate of acceleration. But, you know, for a Ferrari, you're, you, you have a higher standard for acceleration on, uh, on your car. So um, one of the things, and I mentioned this uh, at the very beginning of this talk, is that we have to stop um, trying to worry about problems that are out of our control. He doesn't say this explicitly in, in the book, but clearly this is something we want to stop doing. But we do need to accept the problems that we have to face, right? And, um, the, pro and the problems that we decide that we're going to deal with, yes, they are definitely based on, on our values, uh, which I think is a more clear way to put that. And then he goes into like what are good values and what are bad values. So some examples of bad values is that my life should be filled with pleasures. Another bad value, my life should be filled with material goods and toys. Another bad value, I am always right and everyone else is wrong. And then another bad value is that I will only recognize the good of my in my life and ignore the bad. In other words, we become pathologically cheerful, which, um, again, nothing wrong with having a positive outlook and being optimistic, but you don't want to do that to the extent where in you're ignoring problems that you should be dealing with. And then in terms of good values, uh, good values are based in reality. Good values are socially constructive, for instance, nurturing your relationships. And good values are immediate and controllable. So, and then we go into the next chapter, uh, and we sort of uh, touched on it briefly, is that we're always making choices about what kind of problems we want to solve in our lives. And choices, uh, the more choice we give to ourselves, the more, um, the more freedom we have. And you may say, well, uh, well, how do I get that? How do I get more choices in, my, in life? Well, um, the, re the realistic answer is you have to take more responsibility the more in your life. The more, the more responsibility you take for yourself in life, the more choices you allow yourself to make, and therefore, the more freedom you have uh, in your life. So, a good example, and he starts off the chapter like this, okay? If somebody put a gun to your head and say, you have to train 
for a marathon, otherwise I'm going to kill you and all your family. You may end up doing this because who wants to die? But you're not going to be very happy about it. However, if you wake up one day, thought, okay, well, I need to get into better shape. <clears throat> and you see that there's a marathon next year. And you think, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to spend the next year training for that marathon. And you actually go and you accomplish that goal. You run the marathon. You don't necessarily have to come in first. But you, you know, the point is you went out and you, you ran it. Whether you came in first, fifth, 20th, 50th, doesn't matter. But the thing is, regardless of where you came in, if you're realistic about yourself, uh, you're going to feel a great sense of accomplishment. And, and I would argue that if you have support of friends and family, they're going to be they're going to be proud of you regardless of where you came in. They're going to cheer you on. So um, and then uh, and then again, um, he talks about how we need to take responsibility for how we um, feel and respond to situations, even when it's out of our control. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you go on vacation and without your knowledge, your neighbor who lives right next to you decides to get inspiration from Breaking Bad and makes a mistake. And while you're on vacation, uh, their house blows up and takes down your house. And now you have no place to live. So this would suck. Um, you have, would have every right to be angry and sad and like, oh, what the heck do I do um, to be in the to be in the uh, doldrums, I guess. It's the only word I can think of right now. But you do have the choice and you do have the responsibility as to whether or not you're going to lie down, give up, and let this event determine how you will feel and act for the rest of your life, or you process your emotions you realize, man, this is going to suck. What am I going to do about it? And then, you know, once you process through those emotions, you make a plan and you try to fit your life back together again. Uh, so, um, so it's important that we, again, to drive home that point, is that the more responsibility we take, the more choices we have in life, and the more freedom we have in life. And the end result of that is the more happy we will be in life. So then another thing too, and again, I guess this goes along to the uh, get over yourself kind of theme in this book, is you are wrong about everything. So he doesn't talk about this in the book, but I, I recently took a course in communication theories, how to, how to communicate effectively. And one of the interesting things I learned about this is that we are actually wrong about most things. And the reason being is that it is impossible uh, to gather all the necessary data to make an informed decision on everything in your life. So most of us have opinions and thoughts based on incomplete data. So so we're wrong, or at least we're partially right about most uh, most things in life. And I would even argue that even if you're a specialist in a certain field, um, if you look at any uh, fields, you will find that there is actually disagreement. Um, and that's the whole point of being a specialist is uh, you earn that right to disagree with others and others earn that right to dis disagree with you. Over time, there's some absolute truths that do come up. Uh, but, and I would say in most things in life, uh, most things in life are up for debate. So, um, uh, then, uh, sorry, just bear with me a second. And then the other thing, too, is that we tend to cling to the known. Um, our, uh, so what happens is our, our brains are wired to look for associations and patterns and things. And they've done studies showing people random patterns and ask them, okay, well, what, uh, you know, what caused the red light to go on, right? Let's say as an example. 
And people will actually try to write down answers and try to make sense of it all when really what they were shown is just random blinking of the red light. And what happens is because we try to imbue me, uh, meaning and patterns into random events, we tend to cling on to things that we already know. And what that results in is that often for many people, they will live with a negative situation uh, because it's a situation that they know rather than make a change and go into unknown territory. The uncertainty of a new situation creates more fear than, than the unhappiness of a current situation that is known, right? So we need to become comfortable with uncertainty. Uh, and then the other thing, too, is that, uh, again, drawing on Buddhist philosophy, um, Buddhism encourages us to approach life with what they call a child's mind. No preconceptions about anything. Everything you do and look at, try to look at it as if it's your first time looking at it. And then uh, also um, Mark Manson goes into the Buddhist concept of no self. And uh, just in case you've never heard of it, um, this is not the uh, nihilistic sense that a self doesn't exist. What it means is that there is no constant unchanging self that you have throughout your entire life. It's, uh, so, so Buddhism calls that no self. And then just to drive home the point uh, about child's mind and no self is that you need to cultivate a doubtful mind. Um, so you need to ask yourself, what if I'm wrong about something? Right, because that's that is the first step to bringing change in your life, to admitting that you're wrong about something, and then you can dig deeper and say, well, what would it mean if I were wrong about this situation? And then, if I were wrong about this situation, would that be create a better or worse problem than my current problem, both for myself and others around me? So. Um, and then the next chapter is on failure is a way forward. And, and what I would say to this, if you've ever listened to um, people who have actually uh, experienced success, many, many times uh, you'll hear, but it doesn't stick with people for whatever reason, you'll hear about, well, the reason why I'm successful is you wouldn't believe the number of times I've failed before this, right? Um uh, I don't know whether it's Magic Johnson or there was a basketball player that, that asked, how'd you get to go so good, get so good at basketball? And he goes, I got good at basketball because of all the, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of shots that I've missed. That's how I got good. And then an interesting thing, and I, I, I do like to put this in here because it was a great story, is that look at a toddler who's learning to learning to walk, Right. They, they get up, they fall down, and then they, they get up again. And this happens over a long period of time. And for a toddler, as you know, if you've ever said, wait a minute to a toddler, that's an eternity. Yet they, they you know, they'll keep doing it. No toddler ever says, oh, I don't think this walking thing is for me. I'm just going to crawl for the rest of my life. We all do that. We all, we all just kept trying and trying and trying. And some, for some of us, took longer than others. But uh, you know, eventually we did get got we did get there. So, um, so it's important to just uh, keep trying at, at, at things you want to get better at. And and, and again, um, this actually um, fits nicely with my review on atomic habits because the important thing is whenever you want to master something. It's better to do a crappy job repeatedly than to sit down and ponder how am I going to do a, a good job. So, um, and again, this goes to uh, just to drive home from music. If you have three hours to practice this week, you're better off, uh, a musical instrument that is, uh, and maybe any other things. I, I'm 
I'm not an athletic person, but maybe an athletic coach would agree or disagree with the statement. But if you have three hours to practice this week, you're better off practicing one and a, one half hour over six days than you are taking one day and practicing three hours. Time-wise, it's the same, but in terms of improvement, uh, you're actually going to see further improvement practicing shorter periods more frequently than you are longer periods less frequently. And then the other thing, too, uh, this goes back to the thing um, you were all, always choosing. We're always making choice choices. So in order to choose one option, we have to reject other options, right? And and then paradoxically, by rejecting um, our options, we actually create more freedom for ourselves. So, um, and then the other thing too, uh, he sort of segues into boundaries in relationships, which uh, it's a good place to put it because we do, uh, it's important to be able to maintain our boundaries in a relationship. And it's important to have the right to say no to our, our, our friends and loved ones, right? So, um, and then also we have to uh, be willing to accept rejection from our partner. And we, be, we have to be brave enough, I guess, to reject our partner. Not in a very mean way, but more in the sense that we have to respect our own boundaries and we have to respect our partner's boundaries. And one of the ways that we do that is that we have to take responsibility for our own values and problems. And we have to not take responsibility for our partner's values and problems. And then he comes into, you know, one of the things that uh, it was important enough that I wanted to put this into the slide deck here, is that when we're being asked to do something or asking something of our partner, we should be asking ourselves, and, and this is basically a barometer of the health of the relationship. Ask ourselves, if I refuse to do this thing, how would the relationship change? Or, if the tables are turned, if my partner refused to do this thing I asked, how would the relationship change? So what is the answer to that? Well, the answer, quite frankly, is it shouldn't. Um, this uh, we're, we're not meant to be other doing things. That's that's the important of or importance of boundaries, right? So, and then one of the interesting things, and this actually goes into business. If have you ever noticed that over the years, if you've been around long enough, that um, a lot of times there are fewer and fewer models of things, there are fewer and fewer choices that were given in the retail environment. And the reason why that actually happened is that um, businesses did research and they found out that oddly enough, the more choices someone is presented with, the less likely they are to make a choice. So when you walk into a car dealership and you only have five models to choose from, and maybe among those f five models you have like two SUVs, uh, two coupes, and a pickup truck, well, you're more likely to make a choice out of that than if you had like five, five SUVs, five coupes, and five, uh, five pickup trucks. And then the other interesting thing uh, that I wasn't aware of is that they've done studies and found that when people have a plethora of choices and they make a choice, they're more likely to feel uh, buyer's remorse because it becomes harder and harder to be certain about what you actually chose. Whereas, again, going back to the walking into an automotive dealership, if you only had a choice of five vehicles, you're going to feel much more like, let's say you wanted that pickup truck. Well, if you only have the choice of one pickup truck and there's only one model on offer, you're less likely to feel buyer's remorse as you drive that uh, that truck off a lot. So, and then another thing too is that he talks, uh, and I can't say I really agree with him wholeheartedly on this, 
Um, I, I think if you read the book and you understand his story, I think I understand the perspective that he's coming from, um, which I'll, I'll give to you in a nutshell. Basically, he hit a point in life where he wanted to experience everything, and he went he went crazy with it, um, uh, trying to accumulate as many experiences as possible. And I think what happened is he found that to be empty. Uh, however, um, so he argues that it's better to focus on a depth of experience rather than a breadth of experience. But uh, I would argue that actually I do think, you, you know, I think it's important to try new things. Um, and uh, I do think as you get older, you might find your values change and you're looking more for a depth of experience than you're a breadth of experience. Uh, but he, even at that case, even as you get older, don't, don't lose your desire to try new things. Um, because I really do believe that the, um, variety is a spice of life and it really adds, um, having more experiences makes for a more fulfilling life, an interesting life, right? Um, but in certain Areas of our life, yes, uh, depth of experience. So like in relationships, um, certainly in intimate relationships, clearly, and I'm sure there are lots of studies that support this, you want a depth of experience and you do a breadth of experience. It's, it's a known fact that people who have a lot of shallow uh, relationships uh, intimate relationships I'm talking specifically are far less happy than people who stick with one partner and develop a, a, a depth of relationship with that person. Uh, so, and then the last chapter is called, and then you die. And this is something that uh, will be a common theme uh, that already I, I reviewed the book, the uh, five regrets, the top five regrets of the dying. Um, and the reason why I started my talks there is because I think this is one of the most important things uh, we need to do in life and is to contemplate our own mortality. Uh, because I believe that if we, if we know that we are going to die at some point in life, and I'm trying to think uh, one, two, this is the third book review I've done that mentions this. There's the top five regrets of the dying. There's the good life. And now the subtle art of not giving a, you know what, all talk about this. And in, in uh, areas of faith, like Buddhism, and I believe other areas, we're encouraged to contemplate our death because it has a major impact on what we will value on life. And just, uh, we've all heard the term, no one lied on their deathbed, wishing uh, they'd spent more time at the office. So he goes into some interesting uh, concepts about, we have two selves. We, we have a physical self and a conceptual self. So since we know the physical self will die, we construct a conceptual self that we hope will be eternal. And then this causes us to create what we call immortality projects. But that, um, that is misguided. What we need to do is recognize that, again, our concept of self is false. We have no, no self, and we just need to simply accept our own mortality. And, and again, this goes back into the whole purpose of the book. We need to accept that the vast majority of us are going to, going to lead ordinary lives. And I will do a talk very shortly on um, you can find greatness in just being ordinary. Um, you don't need to live, live in the extremes. So, and again, just to drive home that point, ask yourself, if I was given six months to live, how would my values change? How would I change my life? And um, I'm not saying abandon all projects and give up on everything, but really, really think about, you know, if I were to, do I really need to focus on that thing if I were to die in six months? And, you know, maybe you're not, maybe you are. 
and you can abandon things. And again, this really drives home the point. Focus on the things that matter. Don't focus on the things that do matter. Or wait, sorry, I got that backwards. Focus on the things that matter and don't focus on the things that don't matter. Um, and that help will help you focus. So I'll get back to my oopsie daisy. Back to my thing here. And then oopsie daisy. There, it's a, it's, this is a learning process, but hopefully that'll work. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and uh, and I definitely recommend you. It's an entertaining read. He's a great writer. Go out and get the book. Um, dive into it more than what I got into. Um, and I hope you liked it. If you liked the video, just um, do me a favor. Hit the like button. It helps. It lets other people know that maybe this is something they'd be interested in. And if you like the content that I'm putting out there, consider subscribing. So uh, thank you for listening and uh, take care, everyone.